Hello everyone, welcome to Macroeconomics. Today we're going to cover economic measurements in regards to prices, the consumer price index, the calculation of inflation, and unemployment in the economy. Let's get started with the session today. Measuring the price level for goods and services in the market requires analyzing certain conditions of the market. First, we need to know that exactly the word price, it refers to a single price of any particular good in the market. Goods and services that are purchased by the consumers have a specific price, but when we buy a large number of goods and services, consumers typically buy certain items uh, that may have different prices. We're going to use the price level as a weighted average of prices of all goods and services that are consumed by consumers in a particular year or in any economy. Typically, a consumer consumes what is called uh, a basket of goods and services, the most common consumed items that are purchased by a consumer. And we index the prices of those goods and services to analyze the changes in prices over time. A price index is used as a measure of the price level, and we need to calculate the price index using the prices of certain goods. So any good or service that, are, that is consumed by a consumer may have a different price in a different time or at a different date but essentially for market analysis we're going to use a price index to measure the cost of a basket of goods and services for a particular year uh, and we can also reference it for a year in the past as a base year so the price index used here we have a lot of commodities and different prices we want to estimate the price index for all of the basket of goods and services consumed by any traditional household in the market. So we're going to use the consumer price index as the main index to analyze the weighted average uh, of prices of goods and services for a specific basket of goods that is purchased by any typical household. The consumer price index is the most commonly used index to analyze consumer prices and changes in prices along with the weighted average of prices and we're looking to use the CPI uh, index uh, to measure the current year prices of the typical basket of goods and services and the base year uh, prices of a particular basket. So we're looking to analyze the changes in prices using the consumer price index um, as well we use uh, when we're looking at the uh, basket of any good or service in the market by any typical household. So the CPI is one of the most important uh, commonly used index uh, that is used to compute the, to compute the price level of a traditional basket of goods and services. Um, we're looking here to analyze the uh, price level using the CPI index, and what's included in the market basket is very important. So the CPI represents uh, the, CPI, the CPI index uh, represents a group of goods and services called the market basket. And the market basket includes uh, a lot of items that are purchased by the consumer, such as food, beverages, housing, apparel, transportation, Medicare uh, services, recreational activities, education, communication, and other goods and services that are consumed by the traditional households in the market, typically for a particular year. And uh, analyzing this uh, market helps us know the total expenditure by the consumer in the market and how much is spent on these goods. And often cases we want to know if this market stays consistent when it comes to prices or if it changes from time to time. So let's analyze this uh, market using the CPI formula. The consumer price index has a specific formula for analysis and calculation of the price level of goods and services, and it's as follows. CPI for short, consumer price index, is equivalent to the total dollar expenditure on a market basket of goods and services for a current year, that is the year of today, which is 2020, for example. And we're going to divide it by the uh, total dollar expenditure on a market basket for a base year like a year in the past, 2019 or 2015, whatever that base year may be. The base year could be one year in the past, two years in the past, five years, or 10 years in the past, times 100. Often cases, if you want to know the CPI, uh, the consumer price index or the level of prices 
for the current year, you take the current year divided by the year that you're analyzing. And you're looking at one year only for the same year. But we're going to use this formula to analyze the consumer price index uh, of a typical basket of goods and services for several years that are in the past or uh, for a base year more specifically. Consider the following chart that has a very simple basket, just pens, shirts, and shoes. You have the, ba the market basket on the left indicates the market basket of 10 pens, 5 shirts, 3 pairs of shoes. You have the current prices of today and uh, that's going to give us the total expenditure, the current expenditure on pens. 10 pens times 70 cents will give us uh, the total expenditure on pens, $7. 5 shirts times $14 shirt, that gives us the total expenditure on shirts, $70. Three pairs of shoes times uh, $30 each, that gives us a total expenditure here. The market basket for the base here is going to have the same quantities, 10 pens, five shirts, three pairs of shoes, but the base year prices are going to be different because you're looking at a base year, a year in the past, or a year pre, uh, pri a previous year, that, we, that the prices may be different. So that's going to give us a different expenditure as well. I'm going to use the consumer price index to calculate the CPI, the consumer price index, um, between the current year <clears throat> and the base year. So that's going to give us the total expenditure on the market basket of goods and services for the current year that we're looking at here, which we get it by multiplying the quantity times the price, quantity times the price, quantity times the price, divided by the total expenditure uh, uh, of the, on the market basket for a base year, which is the base year quantity. Time, quantity times the price, quantity times the price. Once we can have that information, we plug it into our equation and we're going to get a CPI, a consumer price index. In our basket, we only have three basic goods, pants, shirts, and shoes. Uh, and we're going to get the consumer price index uh, at this point. So here we have this, the, the chart. We have the 10 pants times 70 cents each, that gives us $7. Five shirts times $14 each, uh, that gives us total expenditure of 70. Three pairs of shoes times $30 each, that gives us $30, $90 in total expenditure. For the total expenditure on this basic basket of 167, that's our total expenditure on the market basket for the current year at 167. The base here has different prices. Notice how the prices of the base here are slightly lower or significantly different than the current prices. We have 10 pence times 20 cents, $2. Five shirts times seven dollars, that's thirty-five dollars. Three pairs of shoes times ten dollars each, that's thirty dollars. So for a total expenditure, two dollars, thirty-five, thirty dollars of sixty-seven. The total expenditure for the base year is sixty-seven dollars. Divide the current uh, uh, expenditure over the base year expenditure. That gives us two hundred uh, times one hundred. It gives a CPI of two forty-nine for the current year. Uh, market basket analysis. This is indicating that you're analyzing one year to the next if you're looking at different prices. That's, a, that's, a, that's the CPI for the most recent one shows 249 which may be higher than the previous year. Uh, often cases we can have the CPI analyzed for that same year or in different time frames from the past. And when we know the CPI for various years from one year to the next or from five years in the past, 10 years in the past, we can actually compute the inflation, uh, which in essentially is the percentage change in prices over um, time, over a period of time. Prices tend to increase, and for the most part, prices have increased positively. They tend to increase. So inflation, essentially, it's a positive rate of inflation. It's the general increase in prices over uh, different time frames or different years. To calculate inflation, uh, we know the definition, which is the percent change in prices over a period of time. If it increases, then prices have become more expensive, or goods and services have become more expensive. And to analyze the inflation rate, we need to take the percent change in prices using the CPI of the new latest year, the current year, the CPI of the current year, or the CPI of today, minus the consumer price index of the basket of goods and services of the past, which is the previous year, 
the earlier year or the base year. Depending on how it's worded, it is it's often worded as the base year, the earlier year, the past, the previous year, or CPI one, the, the which, whichever base year you're using. CPI of the earlier year divided by the CPI of the earlier year or the base year times 100. You basically take the difference in CPI. The CPI of the current most recent year today minus the CPI of the past over the CPI of the past. Using this equation, we can actually find the inflation rate between multiple years for the basket of goods and services because you're analyzing the basket price level using the CPI from for the new year minus the price level of the past using the CPI divided by the CPI of the past times 100. We can do this monthly, we can do this annually, we can do this every five years, we can do this 10 years to look at the past. So let's analyze the data for the CPI. Here we have a consumer uh, price index data that shows the CPI inc uh, changes from 1960, 1961, 1970, 1971, 1980, 1990, uh, 2000, 2016, and so on. And if you notice the CPI, since the data shows, is increasing from 29 to 30 to uh, 34 to 40 uh, in 1976 is 56 the CPI level is increasing that's auto uh, and if you notice that 2016 CPI is 241 that indicates that the consumer basket of goods and services is increasing prices have become uh, higher but we want to know the inflation rate so using the data that we have on the chart we're going to measure inflation between 2005 to 2016. In 2005, the consumer price index, according to the chart, uh, was 185. The consumer price index of the market basket of goods and services consumed by the traditional household was 1.185. This is the index of all of the goods. And in 2016, uh, the consumer price index was 241. The CPI was 241. So we need to calculate the inflation rate between 2010 to 2016 using the uh, inflation equation. The percent change in prices is uh, the CPI of the new year, which is 2016, 241, minus the CPI of the previous year, which is 2005. Uh, it's not the year, it's the CPI. So we have CPI of 2005 was 185. 241 in 2016 minus 195 in 2005 over the CPI of the earlier year or the base year or the year in the past, however you want to see this one, one by over 185 times 100. That gives us 46 over 185 times 100. That gives us a 23.5% inflation over the last 15 years. Prices have increased for the traditional basket of goods and services by 23.5%. This is actually uh, historical data that is recorded uh, in the chart, like real basket data that was analyzed from the consumer uh, index. From 2005 to as just as recent as 2016, we have had a 23.5% increase in the price of goods and services for the traditional household. Things have become more expensive. There's various reasons that account why things become expensive, and we can we're going to cover those later. Uh, but we have a 23.5 percent inflation rate over the last 15 years as of 2016. It has increased even more to 2020 because uh, it was four years later. Now, uh, often cases the inflation rate can uh, have a positive percent change in the price level on an annual basis, as you can tell from the previous ca uh, calculation. And we can have, in some situations, deflation when the price level actually declines. Uh, inflation is good for business activity because, uh, to some extent, because when price increases, revenue increases, and profit increases. So stable stability in inflation is okay. Deflation may not be as good when prices drop. Uh, often cases, for the most part, as long as inflation is consistent, it's okay, but that 23.5% inflation rate is, is, is significantly uh, uh, higher at a faster rate than previously. Now, when you know the inflation rate, you can actually often find out whether or not your income is keeping up or not keeping up with inflation. So it, there's various 
this uh, views on inflation, some inflation, some is maybe acceptable. Too much inflation can hurt the economy, can hurt the purchasing power of your currency, the stability of the currency can actually hurt your income, your real purchasing power of your income, it can hurt business activity, and it may destabilize the economy of having significant inflation. So your income is very important because income separates into two categories. Nominal, nominal income and real income. Real income is the real purchasing power of your income and what it can buy given the current prices. Basically, how much you have you can buy based on the price level. And your nominal income is how much you get, uh, how much the individual earns on a weekly, monthly basis, uh, the nominal value of it. So real income here we have is adjusted for CPI changes or the change in the price level. Your, the real income is the real purchasing power of your nominal earnings on a weekly, monthly, annual basis divided by the consumer price index, which measures the price level times 100. It's important to understand that real income is adjusted for changes in prices. Essentially, it's the real purchasing power of your income. Um, how much uh, your earnings are really buying in real terms. If things are becoming expensive, then if you have income, it may not be enough to buy in them. They're very expensive. One of them is housing. It has become very expensive. There, In real terms, income is not keeping up with the increase in uh, residential housing in some parts of the economy or in the country. Your nominal earnings uh, is the current value of the dollar amount that a person earns weekly, every two weeks, or monthly, your nominal earnings. So this is your paycheck. Your nominal income is your paycheck every two weeks. That's how much you get, five, $1,000 uh, every two weeks. That's your nominal income. Your real income is in real terms how much your $1,000 are really going to buy when you take into consideration the prices. Uh, there's a big difference. Uh, we can actually uh, uh, use our uh, historical analysis of the consumer price index to find uh, how inflation affects salary or do a salary conversion of previous years into today's dollars. So suppose that in 2005, the annual salary on average was $34,000 a year. The consumer price index, as we know from the data or from the chart previously, the consumer price index was 195 in 2005. And as of 2020, the consumer price index, hypothetical projections are 279. It may be higher, the consumer price index. So notice right away that if in 2005, the consumer price index was 195, and in 2020, today, 20, 15 years later, the consumer price index is 279 prices have increased so we need to convert the salary of 2005 into today's dollars basically how much is thirty four thousand dollars today in 2020 um, using the salary conversion the salary conversion equation analyzes your salary in the earlier year which was thirty four thousand dollars in the past using the consumer price index of today, which is 2020, um, divided by the consumer price index of the past, which is 185. Um, I'm using actually a higher CPI, to 294. So this, this 279 should be 294, um, <clears throat> a higher CPI projection. Um, as I mentioned, maybe higher, so I'm using a higher CPI. So we have the salary in 2000, in, in 2005 is 34,000. I'm using a higher CPI projection um, that is higher than 279 as of 2020. So I'm using 294 uh, divided by the CPI of 2005, which is recorded. 2020 is not yet over, so that's why I'm using a higher CPI uh, to analyze this analysis. Uh, so we have, uh, as of 2020, the income of 2005, which was $34,000 in 2020 uh, dollar terms, should be approximately $51,000. So within a 15-year period, the salary of the person may have increased 
up to $51,000 to 161 when you do use salary conversion. Again, um, just just point of reference, I did use a higher CPI from two th for the projections of 2020, which is, has not yet concluded. The CPI projected, uh, it just should be from 279 to 294. I'm using the highest, 294 here. So 279 to 294, since it could be higher or lower, I'm using 294 as the highest, which shows a higher salary in 2020. If you use 279, it should be something like 48,000. Uh, if you plug it in. Okay, great. Um, now, just like we have inflation, higher prices over time, from time to time the economy also experiences unemployment, which we are very familiar with unemployment because we are going through one of the most severe uh, crises of our modern time. And a lot of people became unemployed due to the COVID-19 and the business shutdown. And the government often uh, is, uh, is concerned with the level of unemployment in the economy because people may not be doing well when they are unemployed. So the government often surveys thousands of households to gather information about their labor market activity and participation to determine uh, the number of uh, households that are unemployed. And in the U.S., the total population can be divided into two categories, group one and group two. Group one is going to be the people that are under the age of 16, those that are in the armed forces, and those that are institutionalized. Institutionalized mean in any type of institution, like it's a hospital, academic institution, some form of uh, institutional uh, rehabilitation, uh, depending on, or, or the uh, elderly that are in some institutions, institutional homes. Uh, typically, group one are those that are not working. The people under the age of 18 are children or, or uh, minors that may not be legally able to work unless they have their permit. So group one is the uh, people that may not be fully working. Group two is a civilian population that may not be institutionalized and could actually be working person in the, um, in the general category. People not in the labor force, uh, it's important to distinguish between people that are in the civilian actively participating labor force and people that are not in the labor force. People that are not in the labor force means that they are able to work, but they're not working. That's what it means. They're not in the labor force. They're not looking for work. They don't really care about work. They're just there. People, persons in the civilian labor force are those that are actively participating in the labor market and looking for work. Um, the person not in the labor force <clears throat> are neither working nor looking for work, as I mentioned. They are just there, living day to day. Uh, there are people that are uh, in the civilian labor force that are either employed or unemployed or looking for employment or in transition. Those that are considered in the civilian labor force. Uh, but the population here, the top population here, uh, can be broken down into a civilian, uh, non-institutional population, which are those that are uh, looking for work, uh, employed or unemployed uh, in the civilian labor force and then we have those that are not in the labor force that may not be looking for work and don't care and then we have those that are in the age category of 16 years or under um, they may be in elementary they may be in uh, high school and uh, university um, but sometimes university students work and are employed so sometimes it really depends how you look at the institutions so the US population broken down into two groups the civilian population, the uh, group one, everybody that is under the age of 16, that is part of the uh, armed forces or institutional category. And we do need to recognize that some people may not be actively participating in the labor force. This are special group of people. Uh, so let's, let's analyze uh, unemployment levels. The unemployment categories can be uh, defined and also uh, measure. Often cases people that are not working are simply uh, considered temporarily unemployed or unemployed or essentially not looking for work and there, there are different categories. We have the unemployment rate and we also have the employment rate. The unemployment rate are the rate of pe the, the, um, people that are actively part, uh, um, not working in the market off the potential number of people that could and the employment rate are everybody that could work so the unemployment rate here is the percentage of the civilian force 
that could be working that is unemployed. And the unemployment rate here is calculated by the number of people that are unemployed, the actual number of people that are unemployed divided by the civilian labor force that could work age 16 years of age uh, or more. Uh, it used to be uh, to the age of 65, but now even elderly people are working. So the unemployment rate is the percentage of the number of people, um, the percentage of the civilian labor force that is unemployed. And how we find the percentage is the unemployment rate is equivalent to the number of unemployed, the actual number, divided by the civilian labor force times 100 to make it into a percentage. This times 100 is everything times 100. Uh, and the unemployment rate actually varies. From time to time it's higher, sometimes it's lower, sometimes it increases significant, sometimes we have natural rate of unemployment where the market is considered to be natural. Um, in some cases we have situations where unemployment rate increases a lot during recessions, in economic crisis and economic downturns. By 2020 the unemployment rate increased above 20 percent. Uh, that's significantly high. That the number of people unemployed increased to like 40 million or more and the uh, civilian labor force was affected. So here we have the data for unemployment 2000, uh, 2005, uh, 2010, 2015, uh, and 2020. Uh, the number of people filing for unemployment. Um, the, it doesn't show the, the, the access but the number of people fi filing for unemployment in 2020 increased significantly at a relatively faster rate. In 2008, uh, there was a high increase in the unemployment uh, number because we had the financial crisis in 2008. But compared to 2020, look at the number of people that filed for unemployment just in the first quarter of the year, which was uh, when the coronavirus actually uh, started to take place uh, in, in, at the beginning of the year. Now, uh, the employment rate is the percentage of the civilian of the the percentage of the civilian population that is employed. I don't like to state this non-institutional because if people associated with like institutional situations. Uh, so I'm just going to sp specify that the employment rate is the percentage of the civilian population that is employed. The percentage of civilian population that is employed. Period. And then the non-institutional factor is just a, a way of differentiating between definitions of other textbooks. But here we have the employment rate is the percentage of the civilian population that is employed. Uh, and the employment rate is the number of people employed, uh, the number of actual people working divided by the civilian um, non-institutional population times 100, all of it times 100. That will give us the rate of, of employment. And the labor force participation rate, uh, the labor force participation rate is often confused with the employment rate but they're different. The labor force participation rate is the percentage of the civilian population that is in the labor force. Let me put it another way because the definitions are often a little bit odd. The labor force participation rate is everybody that is working and not working divided by the population. So the labor force participation rate is everyone that could be working or that is looking for work, uh, or that is employed, divided by the total population. That's what makes it different, the total population, the labor force participation rate. So you basically take those that are employed, employment, plus those that are unemployed, uh, and those that are looking for work, uh, and you divide it by the population to get out of all of our population who is working and who is not working. This is the... Um, labor force participation rate. So the labor force particip participation rate here uh, is LFPR uh, for short, labor force participation rate. It's equivalent to the civilian labor force, the civilian labor force, which it's the employee plus the unemployed, this is important, the civilian labor force, divided by the civilian population age 16 and over, times 100, all of it times 100, to make it into rate, times 100. The civilian divided by the population times 100 and um, that will give us the uh, out, of, out of the population who's who's working the labor force participation rate uh, it's everyone in the market um, that is employed and 
unemployed looking for work. This is important because we have several several questions on this. The civilian labor force are those that are employed and those that are unemployed together. That's part of the civilian labor force. The civilian labor force are those that are working, those that could be working. So let me go back here uh, in terms of the who are in the civilian labor force. Um, the civilian labor force is here in this chart. The civilian labor force are the employed and the unemployed. These two, the civilian labor force. And then you're gonna take this uh, civilian labor force here, employ and unemployed, and then divide it by the total population to get the labor force participation rate. So the civilian labor force are those that are employed and unemployed. Take this number and then divide it by total population. When you look at the um, labor force participation rate in the market, uh, which is this one, the percentage of the civilian population that is in the labor force divided by the population age 16 uh, years or, or older. Let me correct that. The population that is age 16 years or older, because those are the ones that could work. Now, there are various reasons why people file for unemployment or why people are unemployed. Some people lose their jobs uh, due to the uh, market. Uh, some people get laid off. Some people don't show up to work. Some people lose their jobs. Some people leave their work because they just quit and say, this is not what I want to do anymore. I want to go on vacations and enjoy life. Uh, there's people that re-enter the market. They left the market and came back uh, after years and are returning into the labor market. Uh, and there's various conditions. Sometimes the market goes into what is called cyclical trends and it creates unemployment uh, during recessions or sometimes it takes time for people to find employment. So there's various reasons why um, unemployment exists. Then we have new entrants. Uh, when someone turns 18, uh, 16, they can get their permit at 15 years and a half and enter the market and be employed. When if you graduate college as a new en entrant uh, and you were just full-time in school and not working, now you are an active entrant. So there's various reasons and it takes time. The new entrant can take a month or two to find a job, but during that period of time, as long as you're looking for work and you don't have one, you're considered unemployed. Uh, so the unemployed persons are those that lose their jobs, those that leave the market, those that re-enter the market, and the new entrants that come into the market every year uh, or every other month or so. We do have a specific category of people that are not considered part of the unemployment or part of the labor market. Those are discouraged workers, people that are discouraged and have given up hope. And an unemployed person must meet certain conditions to be considered a discouraged worker. Uh, one of them is um, if you're a discouraged worker, you just sit on the couch and don't care about work anymore. You're discouraged. You have given up. An unemployed person means that you're not working, but you are looking for work, potentially. And typically it has to be within every four weeks because every four weeks you file for unemployment with the unemployment insurance. So you have to be looking for work every four weeks. Uh, or, or you can be unemployed uh, for longer, but every four weeks you have to claim unemployment. A discouraged person has given up looking for work. They don't care. They're just there on the couch. An unemployed person is still looking for work. So those who do not find a job and who get discouraged and stop looking for work are not counted as unemployed. They're discouraged. They just don't care to have given hope. The unemployed are still looking, are struggling, are looking for work, and they need a job. So we have different categories and different types of unemployment. The, one of them is frictional unemployment, which is caused by the changing market conditions and represented by potential individuals that have skills that and those that change jobs and also those that um, that take some time to look for work typically frictional unemployment can be associated with the time that it takes for the uh, individual with qualified skills and transfer skills to find another job uh, a college student with qualified skills with transferable skills from the university to the market uh, who's changing now the role of student to professional may take some time, some friction to find the employer. 
or if you change jobs from one company to the next one, there's some friction that causes you to leave the job for the first place. And then it takes some time for you to find another work. That's frictional unemployment. Then we have structural unemployment. Structural unemployment occurs when there's structural changes in the economy that eliminate some jobs and create others, for which some people become unemployed and some people become employed and others are unqualified. Structural unemployment occurs over time in the market. Think about technology, technology replacing people. That's the structural changes in the market. People become unemployed due to structural changes. We do have one category of unemployment that is considered the natural unemployment rate. And the natural unemployment rate means that there are some situations where we're going to have frictional unemployment and structural unemployment. For the most part, the natural unemployment rate is somewhere between 4 to 6%, meaning that there's always going to be some people that are looking for work, changing jobs, changing market uh, conditions, um, or people that graduate college and they have their skills now that are transferring from university to the professional setting, people that are changing jobs and take some time to find another one. That's a natural behavior. And there's also structural unemployment that some people become jobless because the automation has eliminated their jobs and become unqualified because now someone else is doing it, etc. Those two are natural conditions of the market. However, we do see that the structural unemployment rate due to structural changes is increasing the natural rate even more. It could be higher uh, to like instead of 4 to 6 percent, it could be 6 to 10 percent now uh, with the market. And, so, and some people argue that the actual unemployment rate is higher than the natural rate because some people are underemployed. Like someone that is a professional but is underemployed because they have to look for work to meet their needs and they couldn't wait longer if the economy was low. So some people are underemployed, some people, the discouraged workers should be counted, some people argue, uh, and some people may not be fully reporting employment or not be able to qualify for unemployment benefits and therefore not counted. So the natural rate of unemployment could be higher, uh, tentatively speaking, but for now we have frictional and structural unemployment together. Measuring the unemployment rate, uh, it's, it's quite critical. Because the natural rate of unemployment does not necessarily mean we have full employment. Full employment here means that the condition exists when the unemployment rate is equivalent to the natural rate. Some people confuse this. Full employment means that 100% of the labor force is fully working. Not necessarily. Full employment means that as long as we have the majority of the labor force actively working, there's always going to be some people that are unemployed and that's the natural rate of unemployment frictional unemployment structural unemployment changing jobs structural changes full employment means that uh, the unemployment is equivalent to the natural rate there's some unemployment but the majority of the people are working and everybody else is transferring their skills somewhere else the cyclical unemployment rate from time to time increases the unemployment rate and it pushes the unemployment rate higher cyclical unemployment uh, it's the difference between the unemployment rate that occurs uh, when we have certain events in the market and the natural rate of unemployment. Again, the natural rate of unemployment is that there's always that 6 to 10% mark that people are unemployed. Sometimes the unemployment rate increases to like 10, 20% due to a cyclical event. And cyclical unemployment is there's cyclical cycles that occur in the market that push the unemployment rate even higher when we have economic downturns, recessions, crisis, COVID-19, pandemic, everybody was sent home. Uh, and in this case, uh, the actual unemployment rate increased even more above the natural rate and the difference can be, in this case, attributed to cyclical unemployment. So cyclical unemployment here, we take the actual unemployment rate minus the natural rate of unemployment. I mean, the unemployment that there is in the market minus you basically subtract the, the natural barrier which is four to six percent and if you still have unemployed people that means that there's has something that happened in the market that has led to a cyclical unemployment rate and remember that natural unemployment includes the structural and the frictional unemployment already there and anything else above it will be an unemployment rate that will be a cyclical unemployment and a normal unemployment for the market sometimes uh, cyclical unemployment is very low 
uh, just as the unemployment rate in the natural state, just so we have no cyclicality. But in some cases, we do. Um, breaking down the various types of unemployment rates, just to uh, not confuse anyone, uh, we have the actual rate of unemployment, which is unemployment is equal to the number of people unemployed divided by the civilian labor force. Frictional unemployment. This is the number of people frictionally un unemployed, looking for work, changing jobs. There's a specific category divided by the civilian labor force uh, times 100, if you want to make it into percentage. Uh, structural, a structural unemployment rate is the number of truck, structurally unemployed people, those that have lost their jobs due to market changes, divided by the civilian labor force. And then we have the natural rate of unemployment, which is the natural rate of unemployment. It's the frictional unemployment plus the structural unemployment. These two added together, that will give us the natural rate. And then we have the uh, cyclical unemployment, which is the unemployment in cyclical terms is the uh, unemployment rate, this one, uh, minus the natural rate of unemployment, which is just 4 to 6%. But no one really knows exactly what's the natural rate anymore. It's, it could be underreported, overreported, and so on. So, um, but this is the, the conditions. Uh, it's, it's actually even higher. I would say that the actual unemployment rate uh, is, is, is higher. Um, in real terms. And the cyclical un unemployment is underreported because there's people that cannot file for unemployment. So the estimations could be higher. Um, unemployment actually varies from professional attainments to different groups and different demographics. We have here the historical data from 1990 to 2016 that shows the unemployment levels according to education, according to race, according to ethnicity, according to backgrounds and professional attainments. We're going to use the one that has uh, educational attainment. I want to leave race and ethnicity out of the question for this discussion, but we're going to focus on education and attainment. Everybody with less than a high school diploma and high school degree or with lower educational backgrounds, if it's going to be the red historical chart in, in the U.S. economy, the unemployment rate for those with the less than educational attainment of high school diploma is going to be higher over the course of their lifetime. The red curve indicates a higher unemployment rate as high as 16% during 2009, 2010 for those with high school degrees or less. Some, uh, some high school or high school, uh, high school graduates, those with high school graduates have a little bit lower unemployment rate than those that dropped out or no high school diploma at lowers. And some college degrees we have some college have lower unemployment rates at about eight percent, and those with the bachelor's degree or professional degrees are higher. Historically, since 1992 to 2016, have had lower unemployment levels, but they're not immune. Everybody during a severe crisis in 2008 to 2010, we had the financial crisis. If you notice that it's higher. This is always what we call cyclical trends. The cyclical unemployment increases when we have cyclical deviations from the market. Uh, the natural barrier is between zero to uh, four to six percent. That's natural unemployment. So professional graduates are expected to have natural unemployment cycles in some cases. Anything above that, it's uh, an important event, uh, or other things are happening in the market. 2008, 2010, we had the financial crisis that left everyone with a high school degree, which is green, and those without a high school degree, jobless. A lot more than those with some or higher professional degrees. Then um, on the other ends, when the economy seems normal, you still have higher unemployment rates for those with lower educational attainments. Basically, this chart specifying that those with lower degrees, lower educational attainments tend to have higher levels of unemployment over time than those with higher educational attainments. Thank you, everyone, for joining today's discussion. I enjoyed greatly the session. Have a good day. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon.